I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James, and I get the honor of introducing you to extraordinary women doing powerful things because they've stepped into their greatness. We are here uh, on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, anywhere you can get a podcast, subscribe, because I do this every week. And I'm so grateful today to have my friend and someone that I admire greatly as my guest. Ricky Byers is one of the most acclaimed and beloved singer-songwriters uh, in the genre of inspirational new thought music. Through her three decades career as a solo artist, music and arts director, as, as founder and director of the world-renowned Agape International Choir, she is so soulful. She is so incredible. She has built an impressive international following you know, and it's from residents of, in L.A. Skid Row to South Africa's Archbishop Desmond Tutu and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, and she's performed for all of them on different occasions. I got to be with her in India for the Dalai Lama. So I, I'm telling you, she's amazing. So what I want you to know, she has written and co-written over 200 original songs and chants, and her message is transcendent. So much so that individual singers and communities all over the world play her music every week. She's so dedicated to helping people uh, be empowered and find their voice. And I am so grateful I get to call her friend. Ricky, thank you for being here. Uh, you're welcome, Cynthia. Uh, uh, you're, you're reading all of that information about me and I'm just smiling. I'm like, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did that. So I, I want to start with, you know, where you came from, because, you know, you evolved into this international personage, right? Where were you born? How, how did you grow up? I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina and in Atlanta, Georgia, between those two places. And um, I was born in Charlotte. And at the age of five, I went to Atlanta, Georgia to see the world and, uh, and returned to my family four and a half years later and was there until I was 19. And then I went back to Atlanta to go to school. And so I grew up in the segregated South uh, in segregated school system, segregated hospitals and um, extraordinary schools, extraordinary hospitals, because the people at the hospitals really cared for the people there. You know, they cared for us, you know, and my uh, 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 my understanding of apartheid, uh, our understandings of apartheid and apartheid, our apartheid systems sometimes doesn't include the part about how black people took care of black people, yes. you know, and how the, in our schools, how our teachers loved us so much, you know, and they really wanted to make sure that we were really doing our best. And something about that really dialed in deeply in me. It planted a seed in me for caring for others. And I think as a choir director, many years later, uh, that same nurturing that was given to me was easy to give to others because I- yeah, because I watched it. Yeah. I watched that. I watched that choir blossom. Yeah. As you loved them and yeah. saw the best in them. It, it, it was incredible. Yeah. And I want to know, before I go to that, I want to know, you have, you know, your relationship with your mother mm -hmm. was, uh, is. <laughs> Man, my mom was the bump. Let me tell you something. Really, for real, for real. <laughs> my daughter cooked this morning, right? Like she, she, she cooked what I consider what, it, what was a gourmet breakfast, right? She cooked this breakfast and then she said, and I have a plate for grandma. I got the plate right here. She got, and I got a plate of food that she cooked and put to the side in honor of her grandmother. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, Michael Dyer, who you know, Michael Dyer came over to pick up some, some product and stuff. And he says, well, what's in that box? I was like, oh, that's my mom's CDs, my mother's concert CDs. You want one? He was like, oh, yeah, your mom was the best. So he, I gave him this CD with my mother's concert that she did when she was 85 years old. <laughs> Mom was somebody, you know, she was somebody. Well, I love it. And I, and I want to talk about your evolution 
mm-hmm. you know, because you were an artist that performed in nightclubs and stuff, right? You know, yeah. Yeah. I want to know a little bit about that and how the heck you got to, to doing spiritual music in a in a community, a spiritual community on Sundays. <laughs> and now you want a documentary. What do you say? Like, like, like Yvette Flanders said, you want, you want a whole lot of sugar for that nickel. <laughs> That's a whole lot, Cynthia. But let's just say, when I when I came to L.A., I came to L.A., I, I had married um, a musician, a great musician, who, um, who would move me from New York to Los Angeles. I'd never been to Los Angeles, but he came to L.A. to find a beautiful wife. And so when we met, you know, three months later, we got married. <laughs> He knew what he was doing. I didn't have a clue. But anyway, you know, uh, but it was good. It was good because it became something really wonderful with with Georgia and Steph and my two children being the result of that of that union. Thank God. And uh, and some beautiful music that we were able to write together. But at during that time together, and it was now that I'm so far ahead of time, I don't want to use the word older. I realized it was a very short period of time that we were married and we were together for five years. And in the sixth year was when I was invited to Agape. And I was invited to Agape because I was doing a church gig at some other place. I was a musician and a singer. And I would sing at piano bars and different places. And that's the way we, we, we made our money. Uh, we do casuals, which is like weddings and that kind of thing. And we were those kinds of musicians even though we had had a hit record in New York, which got me to L.A., <laughs> which is, that record still pays more than everything. Let me tell you. So anyway, uh, I um, was playing, was working at one church and and um, and had done a song, written, co-written a song with a with a, a man that went to that church named Isaiah McGee. And Isaiah brought me these lyrics. I didn't want to write the song, but I did anyway. And I, I because the lyrics didn't really inspire me. But when I put music to it and I sang it, everybody loved the song. And he, he took that, I recorded the song because my daughter had gone through a very serious healing crisis, which totally reflected my place in, 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 in myself. I'd lost my vision. I couldn't speak. I couldn't go anywhere. She was blind. She couldn't speak. Her, she couldn't move. Now, I didn't understand it in that context, in those terms. At the time, I was just trying to save my baby, you know. But uh, eventually, it was revealed to me that that is, that is, exact, is exactly what was happening with Georgia and, uh, and myself at that time. So she only wanted to hear this one song, and the one song she wanted to hear was the one that I'd written with Isaiah McGee. <laughs> she wanted to hear the song called God is Alive and Well. She didn't want to hear Row, Row Your Boat. Or, or the ball goes up, the ball goes down. Little, 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 you know, she didn't want to hear any of those. She wanted to hear, God is alive and well. You know, she wanted to hear that. And I sang that. And my mom said, my mother said, that song is special. You should record it. And, uh, and I did, a little simple demo. And uh, so that I would have it to give to her when I visited Charlotte, North Carolina. And I gave a copy to Isaiah, who took it to Michael Beckwith who said, I know her voice. I've heard it in my dreams. And I've heard her voice. And so when I went there, when I, the, the Sunday, well, he called me and I didn't want to do it. I, I didn't, I mean, I know you, it's a, you have a very diverse audience, but at that time I wasn't all that diverse in my thinking. And when he was on the phone, I just knew he was a little redneck white man. <laughs> He didn't sound like a brother, you know, <laughs> not the ones I knew. <laughs> and then he said that he would, what he would pay me, you know, and I, because I wasn't really trying to go to any more New Thought churches. They just were disappointing in the message. The message was good, but the follow through wasn't as good. And so I just, I had a chip on my shoulder. I was disappointed by the record industry, by the discrimination, by what seemed to be every door not really opening like it needed to for me. And I didn't realize that there's another piece beyond the law of attraction, which they weren't calling it that at the time, or name it and claim it. There's another piece, and it's called destiny. 
destiny. We're here to reveal something really whole and wonderful. And sometimes the window that we have looks like star search. Yeah? Because I was looking at you on star search going like, what am I doing in this house? You know? <laughs> Why Cynthia is winning Star Search. And I didn't even know you at the time, but I was very inspired by what you did and your composure, you know, because it was giving me something. It was giving me something in a at a time when I felt like I didn't know where I was going. When I arrived at Agape and I walked into that field, and this was the first anniversary of all these young people that had established a church. And at the time, we were the people. We didn't know we were the young people. We were just the people. You know, now that I'm older, I can see we were the young people. You were the young people. You know, and I walk into the field of that and there was all this receptivity, all this love, all this appreciation for my talent. And they weren't drunk at the bar, smoking and drinking. Yes, yes. You know, so that's how I got to Agape. Well, I got to say this. Uh, I remember you coming and, and I and I got to talk about the fact that before you came, they had this choir that wasn't exactly feeding my soul. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, here comes Ricky Byers. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, these people who were kind of mismatched, mismatched, all no, of a they, sudden. They, they, had no, they had no choir, Cynthia. No, they didn't have a choir. What, 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 what they had, I, I remember this very well. They had you, an extraordinary soloist coming in. Oh, see, I thought there was a small group of people. No, that they had they, you. Yeah. No, they had you, Maxine Weldon, and all these great singers that would come from the congregation. You guys were there singing. And Michael was choosing who would sing because he had great taste in singers. He, he, at the time, he was really good at it, still pretty good at it. So... When I went, I, he invited me to put together a group for his ordination, and I did, and the name of the group was the Songbirds, and Debbie Gale was in it, and some other singers were in it. It was five singers. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I had a big spiritual awakening at his ordination, I got ordained. Okay, I got ordained. And I got ordained when I got anointed, I got ordained. I think I was already anointed. I just didn't know it. But when Terry Bradford sang, If You Believe, That's you good. sang that day. You sang There's a Winner in You. And I was scared to death. I was like, oh, my God. And I was mad because I'm looking at, you might not know this program, this story. I was looking at the program and I'm going like, who put this program together? You never end a program with your weakest link. You know, you put your weakest link first and then you you, you, you keep building up. And I felt like, they had us at the end, and we were the weakest link. Oh, well, Ricky, I got to tell you something. I watched a miraculous unfolding with that mm -hmm. choir. Mm -hmm. Because every time the choir would get up, they were better. Yes. Were better. Yeah. Were better. And I'm like, oh, what is this woman doing with these people? That they're just soaring. And then... Y'all started calling it the international, they got the international, <laughs> they weren't international yet, but they were rocking. But well, that was Michael. Michael gave that. And I was like, and I said the same thing. I was like, I don't think we're international yet. <laughs> but <then laughs> right. Well, but then I, I want to talk about the music mm -hmm. because the, it, it, the, the two of you writing that music, it mm -hmm. was like, Talk about ordained and anointed. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was flowing through like like it, it was like a flood. Well, it was it was it was prophesied. Mm -hmm. And so what we were doing was fulfilling the prophecy of the union. Because when I was in New York before I had even met Ronald Muldrow, who I would marry and then, you know, do this record and then sign the record deal the day Stefan was born <laughs> at Roosevelt Hospital. But anyway, and, and still have this record that is, is, is still is a huge, un, a huge DJ classic. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. Millions of views, not under my name, but it's this fictitious name, Shamise, and I'm the real Shamise, right? So Shamise is a big, is a big deal in DJ, in DJ history, right? So anyway, 
but all of that was not going to happen yet for, for many, many years. I moved to this place with this person because I'm thinking he's Michael. Because the prophecy said, you're going to meet a man that's got a mustache and a beard. And you guys are going to get together and write this music that is going to heal the souls of people all over the world. So when the man came and he had a beard and a mustache, he was from the West. And they said he'd be from the West. The man was in the West. So I had written a song that says, you got to fly to the West. You haven't heard, like I wrote a lot of music before I ever got to a guy, big, beautiful music that people haven't heard. But anyway, I wrote a song about this gypsy that flies to the West because that's where she will be adorned with this crown, right? Because that's where her, that's where she belongs. L.A. is the city she belongs. That's what the song says, you know. And, and so when I met, when, when Michael shows up and we began to write music, I was like, this is the guy. <laughs> and he, when he heard my voice, he was like, because I had also been prophesied by a, a mystic minister. It's like when he walked in the church that Alyssa Sprinkles brought him into. And he said, it's like you, you know, he said, your wife sings, not the one you're married to, your real wife. You know, he should have said your, your real wife t until November uh, <laughs> until 30 years later. <laughs> okay, I, I want to talk about this, Ricky, because, because I watched you and the music and, and the growth of Agape. And, you know, I mean, I remember walking in every week going, how did we get 75 people here? New people had never been here before. I mean, it, it was like an explosion. It was growing. And yeah. you, like, you, like I, have been married to high-profile people yeah. Who, you know, um, and and yet had our own energy, our own destiny. Right. And so I want to talk about the reinvention of Ricky, because when when the marriage dissolved, mm -hmm. I sat here and I witnessed you reinvent Ricky. I want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I don't know that I that I. You watched the reinvention of Ricky, but I don't know if Ricky did it. Ricky allowed it. Ah. You know, I didn't have a plan. I was taking care of my mom. I was taking care of my heart. I was, uh, and that was enough. Uh -huh. Because I knew I was going to leave that choir. And as, as precious as Agape had been as a spiritual community, what really made it so precious was that choir. You know, and I found because I'd been the choir director for 30 years and I had loved them and they'd loved me. And we'd done so much music, so traveled so many places, won so many hearts, made so much history together. And we loved each other. And I knew that when I left, it was never going to be the same. So uh, I knew it wasn't going to be the same for me. For me. And, uh, and leaving Agape, I didn't know what that was going to look like. So I didn't just leave a, a man. You know, I left a movement. I left. Uh, I left my community, my spiritual community. So there was a lot that was up. And uh, what happens in that place in a person like myself is that I began to breathe and to find deep moments of stillness. And because I am what a composer of the kind that I am, you know, it's just floods through me. And I started writing songs. I was writing them, I was writing them on the way to leaving Agape. In my own mind, it's time to fly. It's such a, it's such a thing to fly. It's such a thing to leave the ground so close and familiar, you know. Well, and I gotta tell you, having sung with that choir, the frequency of the yeah. choir, you know, love. Just love. just love just and yeah. then the music is rode on the on 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 the wings of the love and so i get that because i got to tell you when i when i walked away from my marriage you know i was like you i i was i you know you were better than me i was sort of devastated and couldn't move and i i was feeling sorry for myself mm -hmm. and the song everything must change kept running through my head mm -hmm. and a voice said get up Mm -hmm. You have reinvented yourself many times. Get mm -hmm. 
up mm-hmm. and let me help you. When's and your so, birthday? September 30th. It is. It is. It's Georgia's birthday. That's right. Oh, that's right. It's our birthday. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about the Carol way. Carolyn McCool's birthday, too. Well, yeah, well, I was thinking about the kind of person you got that Virgo Libra. It's like the beautiful thing is that you saw it like that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I my, my thing, I'm, I'm just like a like it's, I, I do well with management because <laughs> I'd be blowing flowers, whoo, you know, you know, and, and uh, like I was doing the day, just I go about my life from my heart. And some and sometimes you need a little little a little head management, yes. but it, but eventually it, it eventually it came, and the way it happened was writing songs, gathering people who would sing along with me, found a place to perform. I knew I would have to sing somewhere. I needed to sing somewhere, and I found a, and I was invited to sing in Lamert Park at at the Hot and Cool Cafe. Agape was now in Beverly Hills, and I left Beverly Hills, you know. I went to Lamert Park, you know, and it was such a good move because people could come on Wednesday nights and I'm going like, I can't believe I'm back at the piano bar, but it wasn't the piano bar. It wasn't the piano bar and there wasn't alcohol and there wasn't smoke. And there were, there were people that were just gathering to hear me. And it was beautiful to be able to sing. And then they said, well, why don't you do it on Sunday? Can you do it on, on a Sunday? And I did it on a Sunday that happened to be like an Easter Sunday. And the place was packed. It, the, the place was packed. The place was packed. And I did it the next. So mine unfolded without a conscious charting. Right. Mine was like by invitation. People invited me to do this. They invited me to do that. Just like Michael. He invited me to come to Agape. Right. Right. Yeah. And I and I'm one of those people, too, that that the invitations yes. open the doorway. So I, yes. I, I totally get that. Yeah. So um, so I, I have a final question. But before I do, I want you to tell people how do they find you? How do they get to your Sunday gatherings? Okay. And how do they find out where to see you? Because you do travel and you do sing. And so where do they find you? Well, I'm beginning to travel again. But. This is now this is something that I'm very intentional about. When I said that management is good, I think I'm really good at this part. Having ways for people to access the music, that's important to me. So um, bradio.org is one way. bradio.org is a live stream 24 seven of inspirational music that I compose for the choir, for myself, for my CDs, from performers at Agape, at the Agape the, while I was there. So people singing my songs. So you, Carl Anderson singing I Rest in Thee and all kinds of great pieces are on bradio.org. And if that's too much for you to remember, just go to YouTube and put up Ricky Byers Radio. Now it's, it's streaming through YouTube, Ricky Byers Radio or Ricky Byers Sunday Devotionals. You just have to spell my name right. And on YouTube, I'm all over the place. And thousands of people have found my videos and my music there. And... Uh, if you want to get into the millions, you have to go to Shamise. She can't love you. <laughs> I so love you. I love your sense of humor. I love your heart. And, and more importantly, I love our connection. It just, I remember coming across the parking lot one Sunday and you going, you got to sing with the choir and Carl Anderson. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember, I remember that. <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh. But your 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 faith and your charisma and your heart, you know, who couldn't say yes to that? I mean, you say mm-hmm. yes. So mm-hmm. I'm grateful. So I asked my guest the same last question. This show is called Women Awakening. Yes. And I want you to know what is the one thing you want women to know about the importance of their awakening? I want you to know that it's important for you to awaken because no one stands like a woman awakened. No one can stand stronger. When we stand awakened, we, we, we make a powerful dis- difference in the world. And right now, what's really important and calling my attention is the soil. The say, save our soil. The ground we stand upon, upon is changing beneath us. So 
as an awakened woman, begin to really take care of that soil. Because I, this is what a, a great teacher said, I heard him say last night. He says, you can take sand and take, or he says, if you, if you, if you add organic components to sand, it becomes soil. If you take organic components from soil, it becomes sand. So we're watching our earth become sand. And so far beyond our, 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 our denominations, our belief systems, you know, our pol po politics, our wars, our peace efforts, this earth needs our attention or it won't be worth it. Yes. Oh. So let's awaken and stand strong in really um, our conservation measures and the way we radiate health through Mother Earth, because she's holding us. Yes, she is. Oh, Ricky, thank you so much. And and thank you for being here. I, um, I want the world to know you <laughs> because <laughs> you bring such light and love and the fact that you've said yes to your destiny makes my heart smile. I love you, Cynthia James. <laughs> so and I ain't, I ain't scared of you no more. Oh. <laughs> I used to be scared of some Cynthia James because you, I mean, not fearful, but I was so intimidated. The last part of that story about that ordination was that I was sitting in my seat squirming because everybody was better than we were. And the, the name of the little group that I had put together was called the Songbirds. So they didn't ask me to sing, they wanted the songbirds to sing under my leadership. And I kind of led, but I'm looking at that, I'm going like, oh my, and you got up there singing, there's a winner in you. And, 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 and you know, it's just, you got to embrace the positive. Somebody is, all these great singers. And then Terry Bradford, a singer I'd never heard before, got up and he looked at me and he started to sing. And he said, if you, if you believe within yourself, you'll know that no one can change the path that you must go. You know, believe what you feel and know you're right because the time will come around when they'll say it's yours. When he said that, I lost it. And I was catapulted into this other dimension. And so nobody knows that because I'm just crying, but I'm, I'm taken out of my body while Terry is singing. You see, by the time I got back to my body, I was ready for all of it. I was ready for the world. I was free. I was clear. You know, the illusion had been like this, and it was music and tone and intention that did it. And that's why I sing, because I know that I know the healing that can come from that, that Cynthia, and you carry that same tone. Thank you. Thank you. I am so grateful, Ricky, and I love you madly. And um, and ladies who are watching this, I want you to. Go back and there's, there's so much wisdom in this. You need to listen to this a few times. And I want you to know, I want you to remember that you're an original imprint, that you're powerful, that you're magnificent, that you're unrepeatable, that everything in you that came to this planet at this point and time matters. You yeah. are essential. Yes. I love you. And I am so grateful that we get to do this. And I will see you next time. <laughs>